Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. I'm excited about our studies for this month that's focused on a life that God rewards. So important for us to think about what we're thinking about, to examine the motivations for why we do the things that we do, and to understand that God cares about the choices that we make in our lives. Let's begin with prayer before we dig into the scripture this morning. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity to come and be here, to worship your holy and righteous name. Lord, as we come here, we desire one thing and one thing alone, is that is to truly worship, to yield ourselves, to bow to your authority over our lives. So Holy Spirit, I ask that today you would bear down deeply on each one of us, press our hearts, squeeze out the things that don't need to be there, Lord, so that room can be made for the things that you want to give us today. May we have ears that hear is our prayer for the glory of Jesus alone. Amen. If you'll open up your Bibles to um, Luke chapter 19, we're going to look at the parable of the ten minutes. It's always so exciting to me to get to look at the parables of Jesus. No matter how many times you look, you're always going to find something fresh because God is not a stale God. He is fresh with his word. He is the spring of living water. He is the bread of life. And so always he has something to give us if we are willing to listen. We'll start at verse 11. Um, Jesus has been in Jericho. He has met with Zacchaeus, Jesus, is on his way to Jerusalem. This is the week before the cross. And I continue to be amazed as I study things that happened prior to the cross at how focused God, Jesus, was on the Father's plan and accomplishing all the things that needed to be done. And um, as he was there speaking... He says, while they were listening to what he was telling Zacchaeus, he went on to tell him a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. We know that the disciples expected Jesus to show himself as Messiah, even though he had been telling them that that was not what was going to happen. They were looking and Israel was looking for a political savior instead of the Messiah of Israel that would save them from their sins. And so Jesus tells them of his departure. Now, in looking at the bigger part of the story, he's telling them that he's going to leave. And he's telling them that he is going to give them something precious and that they must do something with what he's giving them because he's going to come back and there will be an accounting for that. And he's letting them know that he's going to be gone and that he expects for them to be faithful until he returns. He says, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. Now, in all that I've looked in looking at what, how much a mina was, it's somewhere between $15 and $17. Not a large sum of money, especially in our time. But in their time, it would have been equal to maybe three months' wages. Still not a huge amount of money. But he said, I'm going to give you this sum, and I want for you to put it to work. Now, It doesn't seem to be much of an incentive to keep servants faithful, does it? Look at the response when he gives them that work to do. His subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it, what profit had been made, 
what they had earned by investing it. The first one came and said, Sir, your minna has earned ten more. Wow. Well done, good servant. His master replied, Because you have been trustworthy, and notice the words that he says, in a very small matter. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of ten cities. He made him a ruler over ten cities. Wow. The reward for good work is that he gave him more work. He gets more work. The second came and said, Sir, your minna has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. And I imagine that The master was very pleased with the fact that he multiplied it times five. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your minna. I have kept it and laid it away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and you reap what you did not sow. In other words, you take what's not yours and you harvest what you didn't plant. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Knowing that, why did you not put my money on deposit so that when I came, I could have at least collected some interest with it? Then he said to those standing by, Take his minna away. From him and give it to the one who has ten. Sir, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But for as a one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. But those enemies of mine, the eight out of the ten, who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Okay, so that's the, that's the big picture. I want to go through, and I'm going to focus on what the servants do with what they're given. We have the servant who produces 10 with what he's given, and he's given rulership, authority, to go and take care of managing 10 cities. We have one that gives five back, and then one that does absolutely nothing with what he's given. They're all given the same amount, but their motivation and their work is different. Two actually choose to do work and multiply what they've been given. One chooses to do nothing, and we'll talk about him and his attitude in just a minute. But I want for us to understand that the one that produced the most was willing to work very hard. And you and I are servants that have been entrusted with gifts, talents, time. Maybe everyone doesn't have the same amount of finances, but we all have the same amount of time and we all are gifted with something. Are we using our gifts to greater, to make greater the kingdom of the Lord? Are we using what God has given us for God's glory and to expand the kingdom? And what report will we have when we stand before the king to give an account of what we actually did of kingdom value, not of selfish value, of kingdom value with what he has given us? As I was contemplating the two different, there's three mindsets, but the different outcome of the first and the second servant, what are the things that come to mind as you think about why one produced ten and one produced five? Diligence would be one, that one worked harder. 
But the other thing that came to mind to me was devotion. One was devoted more than the other. And I quickly thought about two sisters that will take us to the exact place that I want for us to get in this parable. We're going to go back just a few chapters in the book of Luke to Luke chapter 10. And we'll come back to finish this up in Luke 19. So keep your place there, but go to Luke 10, 38. Mary and Martha, two friends of Jesus, two servants of the Lord who loved him deeply. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Notice what, what's, what Martha's problem is. But Martha was what? Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Doesn't that sound familiar to all of us? Complainers? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. But only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better. What was, what was Mary doing? She was sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to what he had to say. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away. Mary chose relationship. She chose relationship with Christ over the doing and that is the story of our lives. How many times are we having the Martha moment? Distracted by the things that have to be done. Distracted from what? What was she being distracted from? What was she being taken away from? From sitting at the feet of Jesus. She was so busy with doing she should have been sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening while he was there, investing there, gaining there. Instead, she got distracted with, now, did these things need to be done? Absolutely. If they were going to prepare a meal for those that had come to visit, they were going to eventually have to do it. But it wasn't more important than listening to what God had to say. The difference between the ten and the five is Mary and Martha. Mary, those that choose to do the most that they can do with what they have will be like Mary. And those that want to but don't get there will be like Martha having too many distractions in the things of the world, giving this more time than things that are kingdom value. Managing, not that we are not to manage worldly assets because we are stewards of what God has given us, but when that, the managing takes precedence over our relationship, over listening to the Lord, over prayer, over study, over spending time with God, Mary chose to spend time with God more than to make food for God. You get that? She chose to spend time listening to God more than making food for God, even though she knew Jesus was going to be hungry, but that would come. There was time for that later. Given the opportunity, this was more important. And I want to tell you why. Go back a few more chapters in Luke 7. Verse 36, we have to know Mary's story to understand her complete devotion. Mary had found the one thing. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago with the wise men. The wise men had found the one worthy of losing themselves to. It's why they came to worship a baby king. 
Mary had found the one worthy of losing her life to in her rights and yielding her will because she found the Savior of the world. Verse 36, now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, so he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume as she stood beside him at his feet weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of a woman she is. She is a sinner. Jesus said to him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owned money, owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. He canceled both debts. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. He turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Wow. What motivates that kind of devotion? What leads someone to do such a grand gesture? What she brought for the anointing of Jesus, and it's It floors me every time I think about this, that the Father chose a prostitute to anoint Jesus. Oh, when she did the anointing, she was cleansed from her sin. She totally knew who she was and how far from holiness she was. And because she was forgiven and cleansed and made whole and accepted by the creator of the universe, she has this overwhelming desire not just to love him back, but to show her love by doing something so grand it would be outrageous to those close to Jesus. They had no clue that the Father had ordained for her to do this because her depth of gratitude was so great. She knew the depths to which she had been lifted out of. The disciples didn't know that. They didn't understand how deeply in debt sin had made them. They didn't understand that they owed something that they could not pay. She did. She understood that the debt was paid. And out of gratitude, all that she could do was take every penny she had and buy a perfume that was cost a year's worth of wages. And she brought this perfume for the anointing of the one who had given her back her life. That is the kind of a servant that will multiply what they've been given ten times. Gratitude. Understanding that their debt is paid in full. That there's nothing they can do about their debt. It is paid in full. What they can do is take the rest of their life and show gratitude and praise 
and live a life in glory to the one who has made it all possible. You and I choose whether we're going to, like Mary Magdalene, allow the Holy Spirit to show us the depth of our sin. Jesus says, she has been forgiven much. Those that haven't been forgiven much, they love a little bit. Even the disciples, they did not understand. Peter didn't understand until after the crucifixion. Then he got it. He got the depths of his depravity and sin. And he wept. And Jesus had warned him, Satan desires to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, Peter. And when you turn, go back and strengthen and encourage your brothers. He knew the depth of his sin. Dear ones, we cannot think that our sin is excusable and justifiable. We cannot choose to sweep sin under our rug. When we understand that we have been given life and we deserve death, that should propel us into a life of gratitude that is willing to use everything that we have to further the kingdom of God. When we surrender our lives to Christ, we become his disciples, his servants. We no more have our own agenda. We are living for his agenda. We are his ambassadors. He sends us out into the world to represent him and to win others over to his way of life. How seriously do we take that? And until we truly understand how much we have been forgiven how great our debt is. In our day, we talk about millions of dollars like they're nothing. You know, when people talk economics, they talk about millions, even billions. And you, you, you used to, millionaire used to be a big deal. Now millionaires are no big deal because they're billionaires. And now we talk about the debt in trillions of dollars. But if there were to be a price on what we owe for our sin... It would be a number that we've never even heard of. There's no amount of anything that could cover that. Do we understand what has been given to us, the depths to which Mary Magdalene allowed the Holy Spirit to take her to know that she was filth? Filth. Do you know that you're filth in your carnal nature? Zero. God says your righteousness is filthy rags. He's saying your righteousness is dirty diapers. Do you know what a dirty diaper is? He's saying your righteousness is sanitary pads after they've been used. Disgusting. Let me give you the disgust of the level and the stench of our sin. Until we get that, we will not choose to give all that we have to further the kingdom. We will be distracted by the cares of the world, not reaching the potential that God has made available to us. But for those that choose to see themselves in their sin on this side and then see perfection and holiness because the blood of Christ has washed so completely, and be filled with gratitude that when the Father sees us, he doesn't see that. He sees the righteousness of the one who paid to give us his righteousness. Dear ones, it's not a righteousness that can be conjured up. It is the righteousness of the creator himself. That is the difference. In fact, Jesus says about her, you know, each of the Gospels has this account, but Mark, in the book of Mark, it says, whenever the Gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. So deeply was Jesus moved by how Mary Magdalene allowed the Spirit to move her. It moved the heart of Christ. That is what it takes to be a servant who is willing to do everything and anything to further 
the gospel of Christ. If the one minute that you'd get given is the gospel, is it enough to you to share it with others? It will not be until the gospel affects you. If the gospel of Christ has not affected you deeply, personally, you have nothing to take out. Zero. So as we study that God reward, a life that God rewards, living for the well done, and I know that you do, who does not want to hear from Jesus, well done, good and faithful servant? Anybody here? We all want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. We all want to say like Paul, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I, I made that choice. It just didn't happen. Paul made the choice day by day by day. How he lived his life from day to day mattered. Did he have some epic failures? Absolutely. Paul was not perfect. But did he allow those epic failures to be turned to glory for Jesus? Absolutely. Because God will take our mess and give us a message. He truly will. He is so awesome beyond. Look at the message that he gave through the life of Mary Magdalene. Wow. Dear ones, I pray that as we enter into a deeper love relationship with Jesus Christ, that we will allow him to show us the depth of his love for us and revealing to us the depths of what he has rescued us from. He's rescued us from a life of death and slavery to sin. He has redeemed us. He's called us by name. He's made us an ambassador. What will we do in the coming year as we march toward that appointed day in this home stretch? We're in the home stretch, dear ones. We're on our way to the promised land. What will we do with what we have right now, what we've been given to further the gospel of Christ, to win more to his kingdom? Will we be like Mary Magdalene, understanding what's been done for us? And because we've been forgiven so much, the Holy Spirit turns that into loving so much? Or will like Mary, will we have to live with distractions because we just can't get past ourselves? Now, I can't end the study without talking about the third one. Go back to Luke 19. I have found it interesting in the past that people have said, oh, but why is he angry at the third servant? At least he didn't lose it. You know, he did keep it, have it for safekeeping. The clue here, here and this verse in verse 22 is how the master judges him. I will judge you by your own words. What? You wicked servant. Wicked means that he was self-centered, self-focused. Wicked means that he does not have entrance into the kingdom. In fact, when he says, bring those enemies of mine, it's the eight out of the ten. Only two were faithful. The other eight had the same opinion of their master. You are a hard master. And I want for us to think about that for a minute here in closing. Is what is your opinion of your Lord and Savior? Is he a hard master? Is he a master who just requires so much of you that you just can't do it? That he has put the bar so high you'll never get there? Because this servant said, you're just, who can please you basically? There's no understanding. You, you take what's not yours, so why should I even try? He had a very harsh and hateful opinion of his master, but what had they said at the beginning? We don't want this man to be our king. And so he was not. And so they did nothing with what they were given. Because all ten were given the same thing, remember? 
10 were given one minute each. Dear ones, you have some difficult decisions to make every day. And by the power that the 